Okay. Hello. Um, no two minutes left. Uh, um, so first of all, uh, I did finally grade the first essay. Those are up on Canvas. So I'm not <clears throat> And the other thing is that uh, on Thursday, there's going to be a strike. So I'm thinking this class will probably just be by Zoom. If that's OK with you guys. All right. OK. Um, so I'll send out an email just on the off chance that someone else decides they want to come. <laughs> Right. Is it the same time or same time, yeah. I just I mean I could wait and see what happens tomorrow. But most people seem to be just assuming the campus might be blocked. It's good to be on the for Zoom. Um okay, so um all right, Nietzsche. Yay. So actually just a reminder, wait, Emerson. Um dates are eighteen oh three to eighteen eighty two. Or was 1810, 1850. Um, and the things we read by Fuller, I remember some looking about early 1840s, like 1840 to 1845. Um, so Nietzsche was born in 1844, died in 1900. Bringing us officially to the end of the 19th century. <laughs> uh, uh, however, um, he had a mental breakdown in 1889. So after that, he didn't uh, write any more philosophy. Some more of his books were published, that, like, that they already had the manuscripts for. Um, so we're not really getting quite up to the end of the 19th century, but it's close enough. Um, and uh, yeah, what can I say about Nietzsche? Um, well, he we was born in Germany. Um, to make a long story short, he studied uh, Classical philology, like what we would now call classics, I guess. Um, and what uh, Hollingdale translates as classics. Pretty sure every time it says classics, it says philology. But, um, uh, and he became a professor of classical philology in Basel, Switzerland. So uh, he was a professor. Um, in Basel from 1869 to uh, 1878. Um, and uh, he like, eventually had to leave that position, I think basically just because of his health problems. Although it's also the case based on what he says about academia in these essays, they probably didn't feel very comfortable there anyway. And I know his colleagues in classical philology were not very excited about his work. Um, so, uh, in any case, he ended up leaving the university. After that, he lived, mostly lived in Italy in the winter and Switzerland in the summer. <laughs> Good deal if you can get it. Uh, 
up until this medical breakdown in 1889, and then he was shifted around by his mother and his sister. Um, and apparently his mental, I don't know if anyone really knows this. People say his mental breakdown had nothing to do with his philosophy. Some say it was syphilis, some say it was hereditary brain disorder. Uh, it's a little bit hard to believe they're not related to each other in any way. I mean, his mind was clearly very unusual when he was sane. <laughs> but, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, in any case, uh, so his first book was called, oh, actually, so I should say, he first read Emerson apparently around 1865, but before he was even a professor. He read it in German, it was translated into German. Uh, um, by a mysterious unknown young woman, <laughs> and provided with a preface by uh, um, the how she related. She's part of the Brentano family, basically related to Franz Brentano and uh, and uh, Emerson. You know, from army and those people. Anyway, so yeah, so he read it in in German first in 1865, and uh, he like carried it with him and travel and underlined stuff, and, and uh, he was really into Emerson actually. Uh, there is a lot of controversy about how significant that is for understanding Nietzsche. Um, I always think it's pretty significant. <laughs> um, Okay, anyway, his first book was called The Birth of Tragedy. That was published in 1872. And then the stuff we're reading this time, The Untimely Meditations. That was published between 1873 and 1876. So it's like 30 years after this stuff. Um, and uh, and the last thing we're going to read is Les Pope's Zarathustra. That was that's 1883. For some reason, I think I've, I've learned to realize that this is not true, but I still keep feeling it. I keep feeling like Zarathustra is a late book by Nietzsche, but it's not. I mean, first of all, like his whole production, like it didn't last that long, right between 1872 and 1889. Um, but, um, uh, but actually Zarathustra is, is kind of near the beginning after that. I guess maybe the reason I think that is that it's like the most unconventional form of his books. But after that, he went back and published things that, although still kind of strange, are much more straightforward, like Beyond Good and Evil and Genealogy of Morals, uh, which we're not reading this. Book. Okay. Um, and that's most of what I know about each other. Any questions? <laughs> That's what I know about him as a person. Uh, there's some other odd names, but all right. Um, so, um, right. So this essay obviously is about history, um, or and it's about the use of history. And I guess we might. I mean, it's a little ambiguous. So the term he uses in German is. Story, 
which means history, obviously, but there's another kind of more ordinary term, Geschichte, which means is the normal German term for history. Um, this maybe has more of a connotation of like the academic field or something like that. Um, so, um, and he is talking, I guess, about the use of the study of history. Right, or the use of historiography, as we might say, not so much about the use of what actually happened, <laughs> which also, so like, I mean, maybe this choice of term is to indicate that. Um, however, I wouldn't go too far with that. I, I noticed, where did I see the site? Probably the Wikipedia page for Untimely Meditations. That, <laughs> uh, um, Someone wrote an article saying, among other things, that uh, the title should maybe be translated as the uses and disadvantages of history departments for life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's not right because um, it's pretty clear in many places in this essay that we're talking about memory and forgetfulness in a much broader sense than just what they do in a history department. I mean, he is interested in what they do in the history department, but it's like an example of something broader. Um, however, in, so in addition to being about history, it's also about something else. Um, I mean, not something totally unrelated, but timeliness and untimeliness. All right, so I guess I should have left this title up there, Untimely Meditations. This title has been translated in various different ways into English. Sometimes it's translated as unfashionable observations. <laughs> um, I think untimely, though, is a good choice. So that, right, so the German word is which means, I guess, uh, well, it can mean unfashionable. It can mean like kind of outdated, outmoded, um, um, inopportune, right? Like coming at the wrong time, something like that. Um, but, uh, but I think so that, for example, unfashionable wouldn't be a, a terrible translation in some contexts. But I think it's pretty important to Nietzsche that it contain, contains the word time. Um, and uh, so that's why untimely is a good translation because it contains the word time in English. And um, A lot of all four of these essays is spent saying what's wrong with our time. So this doesn't always come across, unfortunately, in Hollingdale's translation because he often translates sight in this context as age, right? So like when um, Nietzsche talks about our sight. He'll translate it as our age. Um, but you know, I I honestly can't think why he is doing that. I mean, not that it's a completely wrong translation. Those, you know, our time and our age basically mean the same thing. But I mean, if you can translate it literally and it means the right thing, why would you translate? <laughs> I, I a lot of times don't understand what translators are thinking when they translate things. So this is one of those many times. Um, so I mean, like in this context where the title of the volume is untimely, and there's a whole bunch of stuff about our time, you obviously want to translate sight as time so that you can. I mean, look, you know, 
maybe he thinks there's no connection here. It's just a coincidence. But you know, why not let us decide that? That's, you know, why should the translator decide that? So anyway, I don't think it's just a coincidence. I mean, Nietzsche definitely does think there's something wrong with our time in the sense of like our age, the age we're living in, as, you know, does Coleridge and as does Emerson. Um, so like he, um, often is talking about something that's wrong with our time in that sense. Um, although he also warns explicitly that you could say the same at any age, right? Because as he points out, this is in the part where he discusses the critical function of history or the critical use of history. He said, you know, he points out that nothing deserves to exist rather than to not exist. <laughs> so whatever time you're in, you always will be able to criticize it. Um, nevertheless, I think, I mean, it is clear that, that sometimes he's talking about things that he thinks are specific to the time he's living in. And, you know, so in that sense, untimely in the title means unfashionable or um, even like outmoded or antiquated, right? Because he says at some point that it's because of his engagement with the classics that he knows he's able to speak in an untimely way. Um, um, but there also seems to be a literal sense of our time floating around. Um, there's in particular, what's bad about our time in the sense of our age is partly its relation to time, the way we relate to time. So in that sense, our time is like our temporality, as Heidegger might put it, right? Like our, um, our way of being in time. <laughs> um, So um, in the introduction to the uses and disadvantages of history for life, on page 60 says, this meditation too is untimely because I am here attempting to look afresh at something of which our time, this time at least he did translate it our time, look afresh at something of which our time is rightly proud. It's cultivation of history as being injurious to it, defect and deficiency in it. Right? So the part of the defect of our time is the, um, the cultivation of history, which is a wrong relationship to time. It's a wrong relationship to the past, but also it'll turn out it's a wrong relationship to the future. Um, Okay, so um, so that's what this essay is about. I mean, the other time is going to come back in another way, and the next essay, Schopenhauer as Educator, um, uh, and history will come back in another way there too. But um, you know, so it's it's about a misuse of history, which constitutes. Uh, something bad about our time and which constitutes bad about our way of relating to time. Um, so, but that's not the whole title, right? The whole title is the uses and disadvantages of history for life. Um, so that is when we say it's a wrong relationship to time, um, we mean that history is not being used for life, is not being put in the service of life. Or you could say that history is not being properly organized. 
right? That in other words, what Coleridge says the methodical person does makes time into an organ. We're not doing. Now, I don't, I don't think that Nietzsche ever read Coleridge, as far as I know. But um, as we've seen, that way of thinking about things is present in Emerson, too. Um, so, um, so that's like, so that's more specifically what the overall topic is. It has something to do with how time could be used for the purposes of life, could be organized, um, and how it's not, how we're not doing that. Now, um, Um, in, so in section two and three of the essay, there's a list of the three uses of history for life. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to talk about those, uh, um, but I guess I should say before I go through the list of them that in the end, it's going to be not completely clear what the relationship between that list and what's going on in the rest of the essay is, right? That's only section two and three. And the rest of the essay, he's talking in a like um, broader way about our time and our relationship to history or whatever. And it's not, um, he doesn't like obviously use those three listed uses to do that. But I mean, so, but I mean, I do have something to say about that, but also I think just in and of themselves, these three uses of history for life are really uh, important and interesting. So I'm going to go through that. Um, so, um, and I mean, what's interesting about them is that when he's talking about the uses and disadvantages of history for life, each of these three titles is a title both for a use and for a disadvantage. <laughs> but it's actually even more complicated than that, I think, because each one of these is um, a use of history. Each one of them does a kind of harm to the past. So, um, so each one of them when it's being done properly, doesn't do justice to the past. Also, each one of them is involves some kind of danger. But then there again, I think the danger it occurs when you're using it properly. So in other words, um, Serving life is dangerous, <laughs> right? That is, it's, um, um, as Thoreau says somewhere, uh, like, as long as a man is alive, he may die. Although the chance may be, the chance may be allowed to be less in proportion as he is dead and alive to begin with. <laughs> right? In other words, like really being alive means risking something, you know. So that's why it's not a contradiction, although it is a kind of paradox that the proper uses of history for life are dangerous. But there's also each one of them has a degenerate form when it where it um, no longer serves life and that's the disadvantage of history for life. Um, degenerate. So degeneration. And art means, so art really means species, not genus. But uh, in English, we use genus for this. Uh, well, and then Latin too. I guess it's German is the anomaly. I don't know. Anyway, maybe yeah, I'm not going to get sidetracked by that. So anyway, so like degeneration means like um, 
no longer being the kind of thing that you are. <laughs> Going out of the genus that, or species that you belong to. Um, so, I mean, it's an inherently kind of, itself kind of paradoxical concept. Um, and yet, uh, um, seems to be fairly understandable the way Nietzsche uses it here. So, uh, it is, there's a way each one of these things, this use of history stops being that use of history. <laughs> um, but it doesn't, not in the sense that it becomes another one, but in the sense that while remaining that use, it stops being that use. <laughs> um, okay, so here's, so the three uses are uh, monumental, antiquarian, and critical. When I say these are important, I mean, I mean, they're important for understanding what's going on in this essay in Nietzsche, but they're also like, I mean, um, I, I usually find it useful when people are arguing about like how we should do the history of philosophy and whatever, to say, to stop and say, are you talking about monumental or antiquarian or? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I was saying, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a useful categorization in some way. Um, so the monumental use, um, as Nietzsche puts it, um, this is on page 67. Um, History belongs above all to the man. The word man is not in the original word. History belongs above all to the man of deeds and power, to him who fights a great fight, who needs models, teachers, comforters, and cannot find them among his contemporaries. Right? So this is the use of history where, you know, someone goes back and finds models for great deeds in the past. Um, now, um, uh, at, at least at this stage in Nietzsche, um, the great, the people who do great deeds here are um, listed under three different titles, the hero, the sage, and the saint. Right? I mean, the hero is someone who does great deeds in the, in the sense we would normally think about that. But the sage and the saint are also, at this stage in Nietzsche's scheme, as another kind of doing great deeds. I mean, I emphasize that because later that, you know, it's not so clear that he has room for these two. <laughs> but in any case, um, so, uh, I mean, this is a way, for example, we use the history of philosophy, or it's a way we can use it. Um, right? I mean, you say to yourself, well, um, what would Socrates say? <laughs> um, uh, And that's kind of a crude example, but I don't know. Anyway, so this is a way that we can use history. It's, um, it serves life. I mean, we, we actually, I think at this point, don't know exactly what Nietzsche means by life. It means human life, obviously. Right? Like not those herds that he talks about at the beginning that are jumping around and frolicking the field. <laughs> they don't, they, this doesn't serve their time. Um, human life, this serves human life because 
it enables people to do to to again do these great deeds. Um, but it's violent to the past or unjust to the past. Why? Because Nietzsche, as Nietzsche puts it, it regards the past as a series of effects without causes. Now, um, um, in what sense are they effects without causes? Well, because as he puts it, like what I'm doing when I use history this way is I'm saying something like, well, because it was once possible for them, it's possible now for me. But in doing that, I'm ignoring whatever it, specific things it was that were <laughs> that made it possible for them. Right? There were specific circumstances that made it possible for them. I'm leaving those out. I'm only thinking about what they did and saying, well, they did it, so I could do it. So it's not an accurate way of considering the past. And in that sense, it's unjust or violent to the past. Um, Wrote down in here in my notes. But this is a kind of transcendental injustice. But yeah, I don't know how I'm doing that. But the point is, you know, like that it's it's not just, it doesn't just get some particular details wrong about the past. It's like there can't be effects without causes. <laughs> there, or there can't be events without causes. That's um, oh, a synthetic a priori truth, you know, right? Every event has a cause. So in regarding history as if it consisted of or contained these three actions of great men, he doesn't mention they might be <laughs> Although actually, I mean, so like sometimes the word in German is Mensch, which really means human being. It doesn't mean man as opposed to woman. But you know, Nietzsche, on the other hand, is not any kind of feminist. Like human hesitate to say man if, if, if it came up. Um, so in any case, um, um, right, so in regarding history as these kind of free deeds of great men, which therefore could be reproduced in any place at any time. They don't have any uh, prerequisites, so to speak. Uh, I'm, um, I'm not representing history as a series of phenomena. Right? I'm like re representing history as if it occurred in the numeral way. I mean, so it's actually a, like it's a pretty deep kind of injustice or damage to the past. Um, um, and it's dangerous. So why is it dangerous? So this, so this is the way Nietzsche explains the danger on page 71. Um, monumental history deceives by analogies. With seductive similarities, it inspires the courageous to foolhardiness and the inspired to fanaticism. And when we go on to think of this kind of history in the hands and heads of gifted egoists and visionary scoundrels, then we see empires destroyed, princes murdered, wars and revolutions launched, and a number of historical effects in themselves, that is to say, effects without sufficient cause, again augmented. So, I mean, I read to the end of that long sentence because at the beginning, it sounds like Nietzsche is saying, well, this is terrible because it may land in, you know, because this can inspire fanatics and so on and so forth. Well, I mean, he is saying that it's dangerous for that reason, right? Someone, I mean, um, it's dangerous to the person who's using it that way and to the society they live in. So the person who's using it that way, I mean, 
you know, like sometimes you hear people say something like, you know, well, they all said Galileo was wrong. <laughs> Right, you know that's that's the person kind of you know saying well since it was possible for Galileo to have this insight even though everyone thought he was wrong it's possible for me too, but they're not Galileo they're just like a crackpot and you know everyone thinks they're wrong because they're wrong you know so like in that sense it's like it's dangerous to that person. But that's not what Nietzsche is focusing on, actually. He's focusing on danger to the society. So meaning it inspires people to go out and try to do great deeds. Um, and, uh, and those great deeds you know, result in all these calamities, princes murdered, whatever, whatever. But then I think when he adds at the end, and the number of historical effects in themselves is again augmented, he's saying that that dangerous aspect of it is actually essential to the way it serves life. Right? It serves life precisely by inspiring people to do, to go do these big dangerous things, which can cause a whole bunch of destruction. But um, when the dust has settled, there'll be more monumental history. Yeah. So does that mean that they, the, the part where they say that he says that there are still no causes, does that mean that they commit the same mistake? Well, I mean, it means that, that they do the kind of, I think what it means, I'm not sure, I think what it means is they do the kind of thing that future people will be able to use as monumental history. Right, they add to the store of things that can be regarded as effects without causes. Um, um, whereas, if they didn't have this dangerous monumental history like egging them on, you know, they would always be carefully thinking about what conditions now are made possible, and they wouldn't do anything that you wouldn't expect from exactly those conditions. So there would be no like outstanding, surprising things that you would be tempted to abstract from the conditions that may be possible, I guess, might be one way to put it. Um, okay, so that's my, I think, I mean, I'm not 100% sure about the last part, especially when he gets to antiquarian history. It almost sounds like the danger is a little bit already of a misuse of it or something, but uh, well, no, I guess I shouldn't say that. But well, in any case, so I think so far I'm talking about monumental history when it serves life, right? The, what's the degenerate form when it no longer serves life? So the degenerate form is when people who um, are, when it falls into the hands of people who are capable of recognizing great deeds but not of doing them. <laughs> um, and then what they say is, um, Rather than it's possible now because it once was, they say uh, it has already been, it's no longer possible. So, um, and they use that to um, prevent new great deeds being done. Right, so someone comes forward and says, "I have this great art idea for artistic, you know, uh, work or whatever," and they say, "Like, you know, how dare you try to compete with the classics? You'll never be great like that." <laughs> um, so that's the degenerate use of it. So you can, I mean, you see in what sense it's it's degenerate, right? Like it is still the monumental use of history. It is still considering those great things without the conditions that brought them about or anything like that. Um, but now they're being used 
um, not to produce more great deeds in the future, but to prevent there being more great deeds in the future. Um, I think that's the easiest one to understand all the parts of. Um, it's also maybe like, um, um, not a fashionable use of history now. Well, maybe I shouldn't say that. It's not fashionable in the academy. Right? Um, it's, yeah, it's fashionable in musicals, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> like Hamilton, uh, but um, but so I mean these two on the other hand like uh, are the kind of things that we do a lot. <laughs> so right, so there's the antiquarian use. So the antiquarian use of history for life is the antiquarian historian. Um, This is on page 73. Wants to preserve for those who shall come into existence after him the conditions under which he himself came into existence. And thus he serves life. So, um, so the use of history is to find out, like, exactly um, what we've always done here and try to preserve it so that we can continue to live in the future. So, I mean, so, so notice, and I think this is true of all three of them, when it's used properly, the use of history always has a reference to the future, even the antiquarian one. Where the antiquarian historian seems to be just focused on like studying the past for its own sake. But in fact, if it's being done correctly and not degenerately, then they're studying that past because it's our past. And we need to study it in order to preserve it. Um, so we need to study it so that we continue it in the future. Um, but it's unjust to the past. And this is where Nietzsche's tree comes in that I was talking about before when I talked about Fuller's flower. It actually looks at the text there and like maybe his tree does have flowers and fruits, but <laughs> I don't know, I don't think part of that. But what he says about the tree is that the tree um, has a special awareness of its own roots but um, it estimates their size by the size of its foliage. <laughs> um, um, this is on page 74. Uh, as long as the study of history serves life and is directed by the vital drives, the past itself suffers. To employ a somewhat free metaphor, the tree is aware of its roots to a greater degree than it is able to see them, because it can't see them at all. Right? But this awareness judges how big they are from the size and strength of its visible branches. So in other words, the antiquarian historian is um, looking at history as um, our history, and so is identifying what's important in it, how important it is, how big it is, how important it, you know, I said how important it is twice, <laughs> um, by like what we are now. Um, and that involves a distortion in the past to begin with, but then there's a worse distortion. Um, if, however, the tree is in error as to this, how great they will be in error regarding all the rest of the forest around it. For it knows of the forest only that in, 
that an inch would have, for it knows of the forest only that in it which obstructs or favors it, and nothing beside. Right, so the antiquarian historian is not interested in anyone else's history, except insofar as it has some influence on our history. Um, doesn't know anything about other people's history, except insofar as it has something to do with our history. So that's an even greater distortion to the past. So it's so that right, so the antiquarian historian both kind of like anachronistically reads our um yeah this is a somewhat key metaphor i'm not sure exactly how to interpret it um, like what does size stand for here really um i mean i don't think it's just about uh, I mean, though it could be this, right? Like, if, as some people say, like, um, King David was actually a kind of, uh, like, um, chief of a bunch of bandits in the hills of Judea. <laughs> like, that was the historical King David, you yeah. know? So, but the history of King David was mit written much later by people who lived in a real kingdom, the king and everything, and they kind of like projected that back into the stories of King David. You know, and I mean, like whether that's true about the Bible or not, I don't know. It's, I mean, there's reasons both directions, I guess, but I mean, but there's something like that in the history of a lot of peoples, right? Like it's when you get far enough back into the list of kings, you start getting kings who are like, they're really such a person, was it really a king, you know. So um so at a minimum it means something like that. Like we're imagining that, that they were kind of like us because we're their descendants. So that's going to cause a distortion. Um but maybe also we kind of imagine that um they were working towards us that they had our projects in mind that's the, the foliage <laughs> um i'm not sure but anyway I, I think you can see generally speaking why this is going to be inaccurate um as long as it continues to serve the purposes of life it's going to be inaccurate right because the way it serves the purpose of life is precisely by um, concentrating on our history and regarding it as the conditions that brought us now into existence and that we can preserve in order to continue our existence into the future. So all those inaccuracies are necessary to make it work. Um, it's also dangerous um, Nietzsche says even when this degeneration, so he actually discusses the degenerate form first, but then he says, but even when this degeneration does not take place, when, when antiquarian history does not lose the foundation, which alone it must be rooted if it is to benefit life, sufficient dangers remain should it grow too mighty and our overpower the other modes of regarding the past. For it knows only how to preserve life, not how to engender it. It always undervalues that which is becoming because it has no instinct for divining it, as monumental history, for example, has. So, I mean, yeah, I guess that was the part I was saying. It's a little less clear. I mean, the danger, so the danger here is that we'll try too hard to preserve, and that will stifle the development of the new. Um, That danger is necessary to this function of history, right? Like it has to be dangerous in that way. Um, just as a monumental history has to be dangerous in the way it is to have to be able to serve life the way it does. Um, but it's a little bit less clear. I mean, in the case of monumental history, he didn't say something like, and so it has to be balanced out by some antiquarian history. Whereas here he does say, and so it has, in effect, say, so it has to be balanced out by some monumental history. 
So I don't know why that's, there's that change from this one to this one. There's probably a reason. I mean, to understand the reason, you probably have to understand what order these are in. I think they're in some kind of order, but I don't know what the order is. So if you could understand why this one is first and this one is second, you could probably understand why this one refers back to this one, and not vice versa. But so in any case, that's antiquarian history when it's working correctly. The degenerates of ant antiquarian history, um, and uh, I love this quote. Um, Its piety withers away. The habit of scholarliness continues without it and rotates in egoistic self satisfaction around its own axis. Then there appears the repulsive spectacle of a blind rage for collecting, a restless breaking together of everything that has ever existed. Man is encased in the stench of must and mold. Through the antiquarian approach, he succeeds in reducing even a more creative disposition, a nobler desire to an insatiable thirst for novelty. It's kind of a play in the German that can't be translated to a bit. Oh. Thirst for novelty is Neubekiel, which normally would mean curiosity, but it literally means like desire for the new. And then Nietzsche says, or rather an Altbegiel, right? Rather an old. Desire for the old, right? So, uh, an insatiable thirst for novelty, or rather an antiquity, and for all and everything. Often he sinks so low that in the end he is content to gobble down any food, whatever, even the dust of bibliographical minutiae. <laughs> so, the degeneration of the antiquity of history is that, you know, in order to serve life in this way, antiquarian history has to. Um, like uh, take everything that contributed to our being the way we are and value all of it. And so it, it, it acquires this habit of um, valuing things in the past just because they were in the past. But as long as it serves life, it, it does that in an unjust way, <laughs> right? It values things in our past to the extent that we see them as responsible for the way we are now. Um, so, um, uh, so although it's like has this scholarly habit, it's secretly limited by this like foundational injustice, basically. Right? So that when it degenerates, then the as Nietzsche says, the scholarly habit remains without the piety. Right, without that attachment to the past of our past. And then the scholars just start to collect everything. It doesn't matter what it is, it's the past. We want to know it. Um, so, and in the end, they're reduced to gobbling the dust of bibliographical minutiae. So, this is something that unfortunately is all too likely to happen. <laughs> um, uh, Okay, that's the antiquarian function of history. And finally, is the critical function. And I wonder if I can understand what the order is here. I don't think I can. Um, so he introduces the critical function this way. To live, man must possess, and from time to time, employ the strength to break up and dissolve a part of the past. He does this by bringing it before the tribunal, the gericht, before the, the judgment. The, uh, anyway, tribunal is good enough. 
scrupulously examining it and finally condemning it. Every past, however, is worthy to be condemned, for that is the nature of human things. Human violence and weakness have always played a mighty role in them. So, um, right, so the critical function of history is, um, it's almost the opposite of the antiquarian function. I mean, it's when we find that our life is being held back by attachment to the past. Um, that we somehow need to break free of it. What we do then is to look in the past for reasons to disown it. And Nietzsche says we're all, we always will find them. <laughs> right? Just, just as the antiquarian historian will always find something to love in the past, the critical historian will always find something to um, some means of judging the past as um, unworthy. And that's how we break free of it. So you might say, well, okay, but isn't this actually not unjust to the past the way the other two are? Isn't this one actually accurate? Well, not as long as it serves life. Right? So, because again, um, every past could be broken down this way. I mean, that's a metaphor, right? And it's a little bit, maybe a little bit tricky to understand what it's actually standing for. I mean, you don't actually destroy the past when you do this. But we, you say you make it not our past anymore. Or you, you, right, you try to make it not our past anymore, so we're not responsible to continue this. Um, and he says, it is not justice which here sits in judgment. I mean, that sounds weird in English, and I think it sounds even weirder in the original. Is not gerecht, but here sits in gerecht. <laughs> it is not justice that here sits in justice, <laughs> right? 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 So, um, but in other words, we've summoned the past before a tribunal, but the tribunal is not going to judge justly. Um, it is even less mercy which pronounces the verdict. It is life alone, that dark driving power that insatiably thirsts for itself. Its sentence is always unmerciful, always unjust, because it is never proceeded out of the pure well of knowledge. But in most cases, the sentence would be the same even if it were pronounced by justice itself. Here's that quote, for all that exists is worthy of perishing, so it would be better if nothing existed. This is from, that's from Faust, actually, I wrote that one. Okay. All right, so, um, so it's a little bit complicated here. The point is that, like, it's unjust because um, the critical historian has picked out the exact thing that we find we need to break free. Assuming the critical historian is really serving life, the critical historian has picked out the exact thing that we find we need to be free of and has like gone after it looking in advance for some reason to get down. Yeah. So would you say like Marx was a critical historian according to this maybe? Uh, well, that's a good question. Um, I mean, he's certainly closer to this than he is to the other two. <laughs> um, you know, I, I guess maybe my hesitation partly, well, you know, like there's two parts of my hesitation. One is, is he really a historian? I guess he is partly a historian. I mean, he's using historical data. You know, yeah. 
I guess that other question would be, is he really using exactly the way Nietzsche says the critic of Stern would use it? Um, well, Um, yeah, I guess, so the issue is, you know, I mean, Marx doesn't think that he's picking out some particular thing about the past to condemn in order to allow us to break free of it. He thinks he's explaining why, like, um, it doesn't matter what we do. Is necessary laws according to which you know this is what's going to happen next, and then this, and that's what happened before, and so forth. And the historical data is just for that purpose. And um, and and moreover, it's like, I mean, um, you can't even you can't even exactly condemn the people now or in those earlier periods because they're you know. Um, like they think they're acting for all kinds of motives, but that's false consciousness. They're really, right? They're, they're really just reflecting the means of production within the society and so forth. Um, however, like when you read Marx, it seems like he's super angry at the people he's talking about. <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't have the tone of the. Um, of the like super historical man that we're going to talk about later or anything like that. It seems like he is condemning them and he loves condemning them because they're bad, right? And moreover, you know, the way his writing has been used um, is not so much as a way of predicting the stages of economic development, which didn't really do very well, right? <laughs> but for people to, um, um, yeah, to see some feature of our society as a result of unfortunate historical forces that we can break free of or something like that. So I guess, yeah, in some sense it could fit into that. Um, I've probably said more than I really know about Marx just now. So <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, it would be a good question about all of these other specific examples of historians he has in mind. I suspect the answer is no. I, you know, I think he's thinking at a much more abstract level about how the different ways that history figures into it, but I'm not sure. Um, Okay, so anyway, so it's unjust because, like, it's procedurally unjust, so to speak. They, like, the verdict may be right because, yes, whenever you look back on the history of anything, you'll find violence and weakness playing their role and whatever. Um, and, uh, uh, you'll find reasons to condemn it. So, in a sense, this, this function of history is kind of easy to carry out. <laughs> but, um, but as long as it's serving the serving life, uh, you can't actually allow everything impartially to come before that process. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's dangerous. In this case, I'm a little bit unclear about the distinction between the danger and the, he doesn't really discuss the degenerate form of this. He implies there is one because he lists us all three on page 72. Much, much mischief, this is the very end of section two, much mischief is caused through the thoughtless transplantation of these plants. The critic without need, the antiquary without piety, the man who recognizes greatness but cannot himself do great things. So the antiquary without piety and the man who recognizes greatness but cannot himself do great things are the degenerate forms of monument of 
antiquarian and monumental history. Presumably the critic without need is the degenerate form of critical history. So I think, but it's close to, so the danger of critical history is, um, this, this is still on page 76. It is always a dangerous process, especially so for life itself. Men and ages which serve life by judging and destroying a past are always dangerous and endangered men and ages. For since we are the outcome of earlier generations, we are also the outcome of their aberrations, passions, and errors, and indeed of their crimes. It is not possible wholly to free oneself from this, this chain. So, right, so I mean, the, I guess this is the distinction here. It's dangerous because we're engaged in destroying the conditions of our own possibility. Again, of course, not literally destroying them in the sense that we're making things not have happened. Uh, but um, destroying in the sense of, yeah, disowning them. Um, uh, deliberately not continuing them. It's some of the conditions that brought us about. So it's dangerous. We're like weakening ourselves. Um, right, it's like taking a poisonous medicine. Um, but uh, it's again, it's that kind of danger is what life needs. And it can it can only perpetuate itself partly by kind of digesting and destroying itself. So the for the degenerate form, the critic without need is presumably someone who or a stage at which people do try to draw everything before the tribunal for judgments without worrying about whether life needs it to be destroyed or not. I mean, when I say without worrying, you know, like, I mean, all of these, all three of these people aren't exactly consciously doing this. It's a dark drive that guides them, right? So, but, you know, without any longer feeling that dark drive, which, which tells them which things to criticize, just like unloose, unloosing this power of criticism on, on everything. Um, and then, then it no longer serves life, because then it's just an all out attack on the conditions of our existence. Um, Okay, so that's the list. <laughs> um, but as I said, um, it's not clear exactly how it's related to what happens in the essay as a whole. I guess before I go on, I should ask, do either of you have questions? <laughs> but I'm just already had a question about Marx, but I don't think you were hearing this. Or uh, Aldrich from your rock. Oh, there's a question about Marx. There's a question, yeah. Brian just had a question about Marx, about whether Marx is a critical stoning for me. I get a long answer, but you can watch the video if you want. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's a good answer. Anyway, um, all right, so one reason it's not clear is because all of these dangers and degeneracies don't exactly seem to add up to what Nietzsche says is wrong with our time. This is the way Nietzsche describes our relationship to history. This is on page 83. Um, here we go. Um, the modern man, quote, has become a strolling spectator and has arrived at a condition in which even great wars and revolutions are able to influence him for hardly more than a moment. The war is not even over before it is transformed into a hundred thousand printed pages and set before the tired palates of the history hungry as the latest delicacy. 
right? So, um, the problem isn't exactly any of the problems that was just discussed. The problem is um, not really. not really being part of history and not really caring about being part of history, right? History happens and that's, that's good because I have another interesting 100,000 pages to read. <laughs> um, but, um, but I'm just a spectator, I'm just a scrolling spe spectator. So I don't think I mean, none of these historians, even in their degenerate mode, are just throwing spectators. On the contrary, in the degenerate mode, they become obsessed somehow, <laughs> right? Um, um, they become fixated on, on a certain feature of history, trying to get it to take over everything. Um, whereas these modern men that Nietzsche is talking about are just not, they just don't care about it that much. Um, so that's one reason of, for saying that this list doesn't seem to exhaust or doesn't even seem to get to what the what the central problem is Nietzsche is talking about in the essay. And on the other hand, it seems like Nietzsche himself is engaged in all three of these, first of all. Um, in this essay. So for example, um, I think this is the clearest one, the monumental history. When he discusses the monumental history, he says, um, supposing someone believed that it would require no more than a hundred men educated and actively working in a new spirit to do away with the bogus form of culture, that's a loose translation, but never mind, which has just now become the fashion in Germany. How greatly would it strengthen him to realize that the culture of the Renaissance was raised on the shoulders of just such a band of a hundred men. So um, that's the monumental use of history, right? The monumental use of history is I find myself surrounded by this bogus culture. I say, oh, boy, I wonder if me and 99 other people could do away with this if we tried. And I look at myself, oh, 100. Men did that in the Renaissance, so it's possible now. Um, but then on page 95, Nietzsche says, And if you want biographies, do not desire those which bear the legend here so and so in his age, but those upon whose title page there would stand a fighter against his age. Satiate your soul with Plutarch, and when you believe in his heroes, dare at the same time to believe in yourself. With a hundred such men raised in this unmodern way, that is, to, that is to say, become mature and accustomed to the heroic. The whole noisy sham culture of our age could be silenced forever. So Nietzsche, speaking in his own voice, says the same thing that monumental historians <laughs> I mean, he uses Plutarch rather than the Renaissance, but it's the same, it's the same idea. Um, Nietzsche is also doing that. And Nietzsche also, um, I mean, at the time, he published this. He was still a professor of classical philology in Basel. <laughs> and he, you know, in the introduction, he introduces himself as a classical philologist, right? Um, 
This is on page 60. It is only to the extent that I am a pupil of earlier times, especially the Hellenic, that, that though a child of the present time, I was able to acquire such untimely experiences. So that's the antiquarian function of his game, right? <laughs> right? He's saying, look, this is our past. And I'm one of the people who's preserving it in order to try to continue it in the future. And that makes me, you know, that makes me especially qualified to talk about this. And well, as far as the critical function goes, I mean, as I said, uh, he is definitely um, um, talking about the badness of our time, not only in the weird literal sense, but in the usual sense of our age, right? He's trying to explain what's bad about it. Um, that's the critical function of history. So I think he's doing all three of these things, but um, Nietzsche's use of the three doesn't seem normal. I think maybe that's why Barnabas, you were like, what? When I first said he was doing all these two things, I'm not sure what you were thinking, but like he's because. Um, I think I'm definitely not understanding what you're saying. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, but it's not normal for any of these historians to say, by the way, I'm doing damage to the past when I do this. Right. Like Nietzsche is not a normal historian of any of these times because he's talking about these times. And um, in other words, um, he's remembering something that he says the historian has to forget. The historian is supposed to forget the, the injustice of history when it's used in the service of life. But Nietzsche is trying to use history in the service of life while still keeping that injustice in mind. So that's another reason. So, so like neither what he's against, so to speak, nor what he's doing himself are exactly captured by this list. Um, yeah, I'll just say, you know, there's something that Nietzsche calls the supra historical Standpoint, which has kind of learned the lesson from all these histories and stands above them and outside them. It would be tempting to identify that either with those strolling spectators or with Nietzsche, right? I mean, they both in some way are people who like stand, stand back from this whole activity. However, I think if you look into the details of what that super historical thing is, um, it's uh, it's not really, that's really a third thing that's not on the list. <laughs> um, and the way, especially that it's different from what Nietzsche is doing, I think this is the most important point that the super historical men um, proclaim this no against all of history. They, they like, they stand back and they find themselves nauseated by it. And they say, you know, no, we don't want to have anything to do with that. Whereas for Nietzsche, somehow like a yes is supposed to come out of it. Um, um, or, you know, 
They say no to history. I guess I maybe mean, I didn't get it exactly right. I'm supposed to be going faster. But they, they say something like um, history doesn't matter because um, like anything that can be learned from history can be learned from one hour. <laughs> it's just the same thing over and over again. Um, so uh, so we're giving up any engagement with history. Any attempt to preserve the past or set up the future or whatever. That's the super historical perspective. Yeah. Because this is different than the spec the solar spectators, right? It is because this is the thing I was trying to skip in order to make room for. But right. yeah, but yeah, I mean it's Agreed. it's different because the super historical people like understand the blindness and injustice of these kinds of history. And, and and that's what they've learned from, whereas the strolling spectators are just like become uninterested in it, you know. So whereas Nietzsche somehow, like he says at the beginning of the essay, you know, that uh, let us hope this is for the benefit of the time to come. Right? Nietzsche is still trying to serve life in his essay. Um, while at the same time recognizing the blindness and injustice of the uses of history. Um, so I think actually, you know, like the main reason for this list from Nietzsche's point of view is just to point out the injustice that's at the heart of each one of these approaches, the blindness and injustice. I mean, the blindness and injustice go together. They, there's, there's both a theoretical and a practical problem, and they're, they're basically the same problem. Right? Like you're um, not seeing everything and therefore not doing justice to everything. Um, or not seeing everything because you don't plan to do justice to everything. <laughs> um, so most of the rest of the essay is about why human life requires this kind of injustice and blindness. Um, And like somehow Nietzsche's way through, and I don't think it's clearly worked out here. And I mean, maybe it couldn't be clearly worked out at this stage, but Nietzsche's way through is going to somehow be to push you through to the point where you can like deliberately adopt this kind of blindness and injustice because you see that it's necessary for life. <laughs> um, So, I mean, it's paradoxical, or it's going to end up being paradoxical, like the most surprised there, but I mean, just uh, because, again, if you ask, so what is life? Right, like what kind of life is this blindness and injustice necessary for? And um, as I said, it's not for the life of the herd that you know doesn't remember from one day to the next, but from one moment to the next. It's for human life, and um, a human life or human life is, I think, again, it's both theoretical and practical, and they're, that is, it's oriented to truth and freedom. Um, right, so that is, a human life is a life that is concerned about truth and freedom. And, um, 
and truth and freedom in a way in which they go together with each other. So this is at the bottom of page 84. Um, where he's talking about um, um, like what uh, how our time, how the, the, the strolling spectators have um, um, are treated in history. And he says, for it almost seems that the task is to stand guard over history and to see that nothing comes out of it except more history, and certainly no real events. To take care that history does not make any personality free, that is to say, truthful towards itself, truthful towards others, in both word and deed. Right, so freedom and truthfulness Truthfulness, truthfulness towards others, but also truthfulness towards yourself. So like non-self-deception. In a kind of double negative way. <laughs> so um, these things go together. Why do these things go together? Like how do you have to think about truthfulness and freedom for them to go together? Um, well, I mean, these are both about being what you are, or like that is about um, being yourself, being what you seem to be and seeming to be what you are. <laughs> um, so like, what you do is really what you do. Um, what you think is really what you think. As opposed to, like, remember what Emerson said about people whose every thought is false because their two is not the real two and their four is not the real four. So even when they think two plus two equals four, it's false. <laughs> um, that's, um, that's the opposite of this kind of freedom where you can't do anything and you can't think anything because you're not really there. Um, so, I mean, I think as I open your Schopenhauer as educator, we'll see like that raised in it more, you know, more clearly philosophical way and even in a way that, that seems to answer Emerson so you remember Emerson's experience begins with this question, where do we find ourselves? So close to the beginning, not the very beginning, but near the beginning of Schopenhauer as educator, he asks, how do we find ourselves again? <laughs> um, right, but, but, but it's already something like that that he's worrying about here. Okay, so, but why does this require blindness and injustice? I mean, on the contrary, right? You think this is the opposite of blindness and this is the opposite of injustice. But that's exactly the point, right? This is evil the way to good. Or in this case, injustice the way to justice. That's what Nietzsche is talking about, right? So he says, um, this is on page 64. No, is that right? 64, 84. No, maybe it's 64. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it is 64. Okay. Um, He's talking about the condition in which um, someone is able to act spontaneously and creatively and do great things. 
And he says, it is the condition in which one is the least capable of being just, narrow-minded, ungrateful to the past, blind to dangers, deaf to warnings. One is a little vortex of life in a dead sea of darkness and oblivion. And yet this condition, unhistorical, anti-historical through and through, so obviously at this point, historical doesn't mean like being in a history department. <laughs> that's why I said that, that that's an exaggeration of the, of the title means. Unhistorical, anti-historical through and through is the womb not only of the unjust, but of every just deed too. Right? Justice and seeing are like arise out of injustice and blindness. Because in order to do them, you have to um, forget everything else and concentrate your passion on that one thing. And that involves injustice to everything else and blindness to everything else. Um, Um, right, I, I'm not going to open the book, but he says this, this is um, also on page 64. He forgets most things so as to do one thing. He is unjust towards what lies behind him, and he recognizes the rights only of that which is now to come into being and no other rights whatever. And the, the first, the original injustice, so to speak, um, or like the, the overall form of this injustice is that I place a boundary on myself. So, I mean, uh, I only have one minute left. I'm not going to have time to bother you with that showing picture again and everything. <laughs> But I place a boundary on myself, um, and um, where the boundary has to be set depends on how, how much power I have. So, um, oh no, sorry, this is on page 62. <clears throat> So right, right before this, he says, there is a degree of sleeplessness, of rumination of the historical sense, which is harmful and ultimately fatal to the living thing, whether this living thing be a man or a people or a culture. To determine this degree and therewith the boundary at which the past has to be forgotten if it is not to become the grave digger of the present, one would have to know exactly how great the plastic power of a man a people, a culture is. Plastic, of course, doesn't mean like, you know, stuff that we call plastic. <laughs> it means like, um, like forming, right? So like how much plastic power does, so right, like um, the origin of this injustice and blindness, the original sin, so to speak, is this, boundary I have to unconsciously place on myself beyond which everything has to be forgotten because I don't have the power to assimilate it. Yeah. So I'm putting the boundary between what I'm doing justice and what I'm doing injustice to. Sort of, except you can't really, I mean, justice means... Okay, so why I'm forgetting and I'm remembering. remembering. Yeah. Because neither way is just, right? Like, if you if you privilege one thing over another, you're being unjust to both. Right? Just like one in a good way and the other in a bad way. So it's, you're not being just to either of them. Okay, um, I'm past time, so that's it for now. And like I said, uh, so on Thursday, I guess I'll say 
unless you hear otherwise, I'm going to assume that I'm just not coming to campus on Thursday. So we'll just be doing it by Zoom. I mean, if they call off the strike or something, for example, it might change the plan. Okay. See you then. Bye.